Thank you very much, Kerry, for that uh, introduction. Very happy to be here talking to you, and uh, especially on a Friday evening as well. I, uh, it's uh, very much appreciated. So before I start today on Asian elephants, I just want to exchange with you with a, a recent Singapore uh, experience I had with nature, which was, was very unexpected. I went to Sumabulu for the first time, and for me, this was really unexpected because it had so much nature there, had so much diversity, had so many tree species, had the, the, the ancient horseshoe crab, had the mud skippers, eh? and I even saw a saltwater crocodile, and to me it was a, a fantastic experience. I did not expect Singapore to have this kind of, this wildlife still here, and I, I further found out that you know it's due to nature society and activity within the region, and and then protecting places like Sungai Bulu was was really nice to hear that that uh, nature society is doing these kind of things. So I just want to say thank you, nature society, for this because I had a, a really good experience in Sungai Bulu, and I definitely will be going there again. Now, back to the the talk today. So. As you can probably tell, I've got a funny accent and uh, I've got a funny looking face. I'm not from uh, around the region. As Kerry pointed out, I, I did my undergrad in, uh, and my postgrad in the University of Queensland in Australia. And then later I, I came to Malaysia as well to do some postgrad studies. So the University of Nottingham, it's a UK based university, but they have a campus in Kuala Lumpur, also in China as well. And so. I'm conducting my postgrad studies there as a part of a, a project of MEME, which is actually within the university. And it's, uh, the acronym stands for Management and Ecology of Malaysian Elephants. Now, Singapore, you'll be surprised actually how close you actually are to wild Asian elephants. So you just have to drive over the border into Malaysia about 30 minutes around the, the Kota Tinggi area. There's actually elephants still there which it, it's quite a cool thing to think about. If you're in Singapore, you're in your apartment, and less than an hour away, you have Asian elephants. That's, that's fantastic. And, and Malaysia has like 1,500 elephants left. So there's quite a lot of elephants there. And there's still a fair few down in the south as well. So that, that's a really cool thing to think about. Even though you're based in Singapore, you still have access. Elephants are just right there. Okay, so yeah, Singapore, it has a very unique history with, with elephants. There's no records or confirmations of, of resident populations of elephants or Asian elephants in, in Singapore. But did you know that Asian elephants used to come to Singapore for an island getaway in Pulau Ubin and Pulau Tekong? So back in the 90s, actually, this happened. Many elephants were visiting the islands, but then the government decided they didn't want that anymore and they, and they took them back. So in 1990, three <coughs> elephants actually went to pull out the gong and in 1991 they, they came back as well, but just the one elephant and it went to pull out Ubin. So Singapore has had elephants in the past, uh, not anymore because they keep on sending them back to Malaysia, but you never know, they might pop in for a holiday again <laughs> sometime soon in the future. But they haven't in a while, so I'm not sure if they're going back to their friends or family and saying you can't holiday anymore, you have to stay in Malaysia. But yeah, Singapore has had elephants visiting there, which is a cool thing to think about. So tonight's talk, I've titled Asian Elephants, some history, some biology and some research. So I'm going to split it up into two parts. The first part being the history and the biology, and the second part being the research. So this should take around 30 to 40 minutes. And yeah, I'm very happy to, to have questions at the end. That would be awesome. And yeah, I'll probably ask a few questions during as interaction type questions. Uh, so yeah, please feel free to, to shout out as well. That would be, that'd be good to get some participation. So alrighty, let's start talking about Asian elephants. So <laughs> who wants to pronounce this word up here? <laughs> this one. Anyone? All right, I'll give it a go. The proboscidians is carefully pronounced that way. So within that word, you can probably probably sound out the word proboscis. So that means elongated nose or trunk. And this, and the Asian elephant is this one here. And it belongs to this ancient order of elephants. They date back to, to 60 million years ago. 
And this guy's name is even longer than that, so I'm just going to call him Frank, all right, just to keep it simple. So Frank was the first proboscidean out of the whole order here, and he originated back in, back in Morocco, in northern Africa. And so from there, all these other elephant species radiated and became their own. And after the last glacial period, all of these elephant species died out except for the, the Asian elephant and, and the African. So I'm just going to give a, a, a quick schematic of how the species radiated throughout the world. So when I talk about Frank being around 60 million years ago, he was about here. And, and this is what we nowadays call Africa. This is, this is Europe and the Middle East and, and then Asia here and then Southeast Asia is over here. And then you've got North America up here and South America. So 60 million years ago, the world looked quite different to what it is today. So Frank wasn't able to radiate into to Europe and Asia straight away because there was a glacial here that froze across and so there were no animals able to get into to Europe and Asia. So Frank and his friends just radiated within <coughs> Africa until uh, this f f unfroze and they were able to go into this, this landmass here. And once that happened, it happened quite quickly and they traveled quite fast. So the red colors you see here is the first radiation of, of new species from all starting uh, deriving from Frankia. So they radiated all through Asia and Europe and up into, into North America. And then the last set of uh, species that evolved out of the, here were the ones in the black. So you've got your, your African elephant down here and your Asian elephant. So your Asian elephant actually originated somewhere in, in East Asia. So does anyone want to uh, shout out any living species they can think of at the moment for the, the proboscideans there? Bit of a tongue twister there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've named a couple already that might give a bit of a hint. What about Tapia? Tapia? Not part of the pro proboscideans, no. But any living species left? So tonight's talk's about the Asian elephant, so that's, that's at least one. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got another two species actually left. Hyrax? Sorry? Hyrax? Hyrax? Not Hyrax. No, it's a close... Pygmy? Close cousin? Pygmy elephant? No. The, Asian, uh, the African elephant is one. And then the forest elephant, yes. Very good. So actually three living species left. And yes, they do have quite close relatives, but not in the same order as the... So quite interesting, this, this African forest elephant was only recently described in 2010 as being separate from its <coughs> other African savanna cousin. And the genetic studies show that this elephant was actually diverged as a completely new, uh, new species like two million years ago. <coughs> so we've been naming this, these two as the same for, for quite a long time and they've been separated for even longer. Okay, so scientists like to put evolutionary type things in perspective as in an evolutionary tree or a taxonomic tree. And I just want to show <coughs> how long this has actually taken in evolutionary time for the Asian species to be diverged from the, the African. So the Asian species diverged around the same time as the woolly mammoth, but it's not around anymore. So living today, the Asian elephant is the oldest elephant species. And then the, the African savanna and the, the forest elephant actually diverged about six million years ago, so after the Asian elephant. To give some sort of uh, context between you and I, we evolved from chimpanzees uh, between five to seven million years ago. So there's a bit of an overlap here of when this evolution was happening. And between the both species, it's around the same time, around two million years you have it takes for these kind of <coughs> things to actually unfold. So, the Asian elephant, the largest terrestrial mammal in Asia. So this elephant is about 2.8 meters tall, it weighs about 4 tons, and is an extremely important ecological, has a completely, sorry, has a an important ecological function in the in the wild, and that is as, as a seed disperser. So that might be a new term for some people, but what a seed disperser means is just 
something that takes up a seed or something that contains a seed and just moves it to somewhere else. And the elephant is fantastic at this. There's, there's no other animal that can do seed dispersal better than the elephant. So the elephant's gut is very big. It can fit like 100 kilos of seeds inside its belly. And it can walk hundreds of kilometers around. So every day, this elephant can eat hundreds of kilos of food, whether it's fruit and fruit that contains seed or grasses. So as a, a seed disperser, this elephant is going around the whole landscape, eating all this food, eating all these seeds, and walking far away, and then <coughs> defecating or, or pooing these seeds out at the end. And it poos up to 100 kilos a day. So you imagine all those seeds going through its system. So it's pretty much just like a farmer of seeds. It's just going around, placing seeds everywhere into the forest. And so that's a pretty cool thing to think about. And, and no other animal can do that. Animals can eat the seed, but they, they crush on the seed and they destroy it. So the seed can't germinate. Whereas this seed here, it's, it's actually a seed. So you have to go through the dung and take this seed out. So this is the, an intact seed and it's the size of, size of my palm. And this is what my boss did for his PhD. So he, he looked through poo for his PhD. <laughs> but this is only one seed actually out of the three that come in this fruit. And this is from Sri Lanka. And so the elephant is able to eat this fruit completely and ingest these seeds and it can come out the other end no problem and then germinate. So when you're walking, in, if you get a chance to come to Malaysia and you're walking in the forest and you see like a mango tree or a, a natural durian tree, not like an orchard one, or a mango steam tree, it's probably because an elephant walked there one day and pooed out a seed and then it germinated. So as an ecological function, these guys are irreplaceable because all the fruiting seeds you have in the wild are probably due to an elephant sometime uh, it coming out the other end. So that's a, and I, I think that's really, really cool. So to touch on Asian elephant society quickly, it's a matriarchal society. So the females like to hang out in, in groups and we call the females cows. They like to hang out with their friends and their relatives. They like to eat together. I'm sure they gossip and stuff like that, like other females, like humans do. And the males are quite similar as well with humans. They like to be by themselves and bachelor and just walking around doing their things. And sometimes they get together in bachelor groups and they go and uh, annoy some females as well. <coughs> they leave quite early from their, their matriarchal groups, as early as six or seven, but you know, it can be around 10 or 12 or 13 as well. So that, that's what we, we call uh, elephants. Uh, we call them either bulls or cows. So I'm sure there's a few people here that are happy that their pregnancy didn't last 22 months, but the elephants does. And at about, about 12 months of age, it's actually quite developed already. It's just got to grow a bit more because they've got to grow about 90 kilos to 100 kilos. And they have a calf maybe every three years, singly. They, they, they don't have twins. And they drink a lot of milk per day as well. So 10 liters of milk. Elephants don't have a mating season. Uh, usually, if it's a drought or something like that, you won't see many animal. Uh, you won't see many elephant calves because they're trying to to just keep the, the energy for themselves. And the first time they'll have a baby will be quite young, comparatively, around 10 to 12 years of age. Even younger, they've had it in zoos. And yeah, the estrus cycle is only for like a week. <coughs> So I get this question a lot. People ask me, Jamie, can you tell actually any difference between elephants? They, like they all look the same to me. Like when you look at one, one may be taller than the other, but other than that, they all look the same. So the answer is yes, you can tell, and it's not too hard to tell the difference either once you you start to know what to look for. So for me, I think of the ears of an Asian elephant as like a fingerprint. It's, it's almost unique, and in many cases it is. If you look at these ear folds at the top here, this is just folded over a little bit, and then if you come down to the next picture, it's actually folded over quite a bit. So that's a dead giveaway right there. And they don't usually change that much over time. They, they probably get a bit more floppier. But as the elephant gets older, it's gone through more rough terrain, it's gone through more thorns and whatever, and it can actually tear and holes can happen in their ears. And it's not bad for it, it doesn't hurt the elephant, it's just wear and tear. 
And so you can really get some unique features for an elephant with the ear. Pigmentation is another one here that you can see. It's quite different <coughs> between another. And tusks as well. So when you get a tusk, it's very unique as well. You can get different lengths, you can get different shapes, different, uh, different colors as well. So all these things together, you can look at elephants and you can actually <coughs> ID them individually uh, quite quickly sometimes. All right. So here I want some interaction and I want to see how many, well actually, firstly, we've got two species of elephants here. We've got African and male. We've got no forest elephants up here. Uh, so we've got African and Asian, and we don't have any uh, forest species. So I want to see uh, what you guys think of this elephant here. Is it a female African, a male African, or an Asian male, or an Asian female? Does anyone want to just raise a hand for anything? African. African male. African. Very good. And this fellow over here? Asian male. Asian male. Beautiful. And the one down there was the Asian female. Sorry. Trigger happy there. So, that leaves an African female. So, does anyone want to ID anything that can be seen between an African and an Asian? What's different? There's, there are some uh, quite yeah, interesting things there. The that. trunk is thinner and more delicate. The, the size of the trunk? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's not as chunky as the elephant. Yep, yeah, that, that, that can be one. Um, that normally just correlates with the size of the elephant. So, the top yes. of the head, yeah, that's a very good one. So, the top of the head here, for the Asian elephant, it, it's quite unique. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a bulbous type shape, where the African is quite rounded and just goes straight down. So, you can have quite a dimple here and, and different things going on where the African elephant is just, it's just shaped over just nice and smoothly. Anyone else have any? The ears. The ears? Yeah. So look how big the ear is for the African male. And look how small it is for the Asian. It's quite a big different size. So in Africa, they need to ventilate themselves a lot more. So they need much bigger ears thumping around. And anything else? Sorry. Tusks? Yes. So eight. <coughs> Asian female doesn't have tusks, where the African female does. Interestingly, not all Asian males have tusks as well. So just because an Asian, an Asian elephant doesn't have tusks doesn't mean it's a female either. So that's, that's, that's one that's a bit tricky all the, all the same. But I've met an Asian female that have tusks. They do, but they're, they're only like Smaller. very, very, like they barely come out of their mouth. So you, you, you hardly ever... You see it. See them, yeah. The ones that you can't see, do they have the same thing? Is it just prominent in some, or is it absent? Some of them complete. Most of them don't have absent. them at all. Just okay. completely absent. Yeah. You do get some that just little just tucked just tucked up under there, but generally the females don't have them at all. Yeah. But they'll keep it for life still. Yeah, they'll keep it for life. Okay. <coughs> so, yeah. So the African male can weigh up to six tons, where the that uh, Af uh, the Asian male can weigh up to four, and the and the height of the, the African male can get up to three meters, but the, the African male can get uh, at least a meter more than the, the Asian elephant, so he can get up to uh, four plus. It's quite 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 taller than the than its uh, relative. Alrighty. So, some of the threats for Asian elephants. Like most mammals in Asia, deforestation and land use change is, is a massive threat. With Asian elephants though, when you chop down the forest, it doesn't kill the, the elephants. They're still there. They, they, they live very long. They can live up to 70 years. But just because you cut down the forest doesn't mean that they're going to die. However, they do retreat into the surrounding forest and then in this case, it's a very common scenario. You have plantations, which like oil, palm, or rubber are being planted outside <coughs> the forest. And when you have these plantations being uh, developed, you have a lot of grasses growing. And grasses in a forest are quite rare because of the canopy. It doesn't allow any water, doesn't allow any sunlight to go to the bottom. So you have very little grass. So if you're an elephant and you have to walk very, very far into the forest to find grass, 
and you come to this bit, it's like it's like a buffet. Like you just go there and you can just eat whatever you want. And and you don't have to walk far that and that's and that's really good in the sense of elephants don't have to move. But there's conflict that happens, there's poaching, there's poisoning because this is people's livelihoods and so they don't want them to the, the elephants actually destroy these plantations when they're really small baby palms because they don't want them to grow big because when they grow bigger then there's less grass on the ground. So this is a result, this is our the boss from the, the, the Meme project and he came across some, some poaching in this kind of scenario with the, with the forest uh, being cut down and replanted. So the Asian elephant, its distribution is very small compared to what it once was. It ranged quite far and, and it's lost a lot of its range in, in recent times. But the Asian elephant also, I think, is very interesting in terms of the role they play in Asian cultures. So in countries like Myanmar, Sri Lanka, India, people feel a deep respect and often love towards animal and they do religious ceremonies and stuff like that. It, it's quite different to people in the West. You don't, you don't see this kind of affinity and connection for elephants that they may not even seen before, they're in the wild. So I, I think that is a very unique characteristic for an animal in Asia and comparing that to the West. So that sums up the first part of my talk. So that's part one. And now on to some research. So this is the juicy stuff. So MEME, what is MEME? We're a five-year research project. It's a collaboration between a government and a university. And what we're trying to do is do science-driven based conservation in Malaysia at the same time whilst building capacity. And so this is the MEME. This is part of the MEME. Um, group at the moment. We've actually grown quite a bit in the last year. So we've actually got probably 16 or 17 people now. And you can see most of them are made up of, of, of Malaysians. There's still a few more. You can't get rid of us that easily, but <laughs> we're here. But most of them are doing PhDs and masters in research. And the good thing is when the project finishes, that's going to stay in Malaysia. And that knowledge and that skills are going to stay there. So we actually also hire uh, Arong Asli as well. They're tremendous in our field work. They're able to find elephants for us and, 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 and they make up four or five in our team as well. So it's quite a big group. They're very photo shy, so I couldn't get a photo of them in here, unfortunately. But yeah, this is our boss, Himza. So he actually used to work in Singapore. Some of you <coughs> may know or have heard of him as a Spanish researcher. But he is the, the principal investigator and, and he's the one that's uh, founded Meme. So the research side of things today, I'd like to talk about four different research areas that we, and, and they are all being driven by, by data collection. So we want to collect data for conservation science approach. So we want to collect data to answer questions that are related to conservation. So the first topic is the status and trend of elephant populations. So how is Miam going about that? Well, we want to map in Malaysia, where are the elephants? And where they used to be, to, to kind of look at the difference in their distribution within Malaysia. Now, how are we doing about that? Angie is going around and surveying people. It's a very rapid assessment. Well, she may beg the difference, taking two years of her life so far. <laughs> and she's basically gridded up Malaysia into 25 square kilometer grids. And she goes there, and in each grid, she asks several uncles that have been there for like 30 years plus, and she asks them, are elephants there? How long ago were elephants? And if so, when did they disappear? So it seems like not too much of a scientific kind of base to it, <coughs> but it is a very quick way to do it. And it's surprisingly accurate because we just want to know where the elephants were. We just want to know the presence. And you don't need to, to spend a lot of money to, to work that out. So survey method for a distribution map is a very good way to go about it. And so this is some of her results. So 11% of Malaysia being sampled. So the, the, the white here means the survey she has surveyed. The, the orange here means that the elephants are present. So you can see in comparing between the 11 and the, and the 28 percent of grids, there's been quite a reduction in, in elephants. And particularly on the, the west coast, 
of Malaysia, there's a clear line where elephants are not present and have been, uh, actually I should explain that there, the, the red, it means the elephants were there, but they're not anymore. So that line shows a complete separation of where elephants are currently being now. So we actually get elephants still down around here in, in, in the southern part of Johor, which is quite close to, quite close to Singapore. So there are lots of areas within Malaysia that have big tracts of forest, and Angie's not going to go in there and survey and try and look for an uncle or something like that. There's no one going to be there. So we supplement that with, with GPS data. So we go into the forest, and we GPS collar some elephants. And how that works is, this is a, a GPS collar here. So it's quite big, so you know, it's, it's, it's not small by any means. And how this works is, it's got a, a GPS phone inside it, and a couple of rows of batteries, and it just transmits to satellite network. And then it just sends me a nice little information into my laptop. So this is the current data that Meme has collected from GPS data. And you can see here the gaps that Angie didn't survey. There's actually elephants in there as well. So we get a bit more of a, a holistic, not a holistic, but a, a whole view of, of, of where the elephants are being. And so Miriam has collared 43 elephants so far. And we've collected over 160,000 GPS points. <coughs> and that is a result of collecting a GPS point every two hours. So a GPS collar can last up to 900 days. <coughs> Is quite a long time. Alrighty, so that <coughs> is the end of the, the status. So Meme is doing distribution maps, collecting where the elephants were and where they were not, and supplementing that with the GPS data. And now to look at the, infra the effect of infrastructure on development. Malaysia is developing quite quickly. You've got lots of cities popping up. And, and how are elephants are affected by this? So the question for this is, are roads barriers from elephants? <laughs> This is a GPS collar on the elephant <coughs> as well. And roads are popping up everywhere, and there's still many elephants in Malaysia. So how are these roads affecting their, their elephant movements? Are they actually able to cross roads? So it's not uncommon to see an elephant on the road when you're in northern Malaysia either, up in the Perak, in the, the northern part of Perak, but elephants have no problem crossing the road. The, it's not an impermeable barrier, so they are able to cross uh, not too much of an issue if the traffic is okay. So this kind of question can help feed into a big project in Malaysia. It's called the Central Forest Spine Project. And what it aims to do is to connect up all the remaining fragments of forest in Malaysia. So there's about <coughs> 35 to close to 40% of forest left in Malaysia. Still quite a bit. And questions like this that me and we're going to answer, or try to answer, can really help with this kind of approach. Now, how some of the central forest forest <coughs> buying projects are working is they're building viaducts. So I believe Singapore has one, uh, an overpass. In Malaysia, they've built uh, an underpass, so the opposite. And I'm just going to give a case study here in the, the north part of Malaysia, in the Balung Temenggul area. Uh, they've put a, a viaduct here. Quite expensive as well, not cheap. So, so this question here, is the road a barrier for elephants? It is not. The elephants are able to, to cross here. However, it's all in context. So at the moment, in this landscape, there is a lot of forest. There's a lot of primary, a lot of primary forest around there, and elephants are able to move wherever they want. And the traffic volume <coughs> is actually quite low. There's the few logging trucks. There's not like a Singapore jam or anything like that there. It's quite quite slow moving, so <coughs> the elephants have relative ease moving around, but in the future, I'm sure the population is going to increase and the, the value of this viaduct may be used quite a lot in the future. When you've got more traffic going through here and continuously going through here, it may deter the elephants in the future to cross wherever they want, so they may look for these viaducts in the future. 
So Malaysia in that context is looking into the future as well. However, even with the current low traffic volume, we're still getting cars colliding with elephants. So that video you saw, this is the same elephant. And two or three weeks later, he was missing a tusk. And it was reported in the news that a car had hit this elephant. The elephant was able to survive and we followed him for a while and there was a little bit of blood and mucusy stuff coming out, but he survived. So it's probably not the first time this has happened and probably won't be the last, particularly if the, the road volume increases as well. So to give a bit of a, an understanding of how this elephant moves around in this landscape, so this is all forest, this is all nice forest here, and you've got this big highway that goes through. And this generally is the only paved road in this landscape. You have kampongs here, it's got the nice dirt <coughs> roads, and you have a couple of hotels around there. But generally, it's just this highway right through the forest. And we see here that he moves around quite far from the road, but he stays quite close to the road. And he crosses the road quite a lot as well, compared to what we thought he would. We didn't think they would cross the road that much. So this is quite interesting to see that he is crossing the road, but he's also going out to here as well, but mainly he hangs around the road. <laughs> interesting. Is he running around the lands or with other elephants? Or is he single? <coughs> so he's a male and he's about 20 years of age, so he's by himself. He does link up sometimes with other males, but generally by himself. And now the GPS is actually finished and the last location we've got is in Thailand somewhere. So, yeah, can't, can't put a new GPS call on him because I can't get there, not allowed to. <laughs> so, yeah, this, to give a bit more of a context, this is a, the same road, but we have 14 or 16 elephants here. And these white dots that you see are locations where the A elephant has crossed the road. So there's many areas within the road that the elephants cross. There's no real restriction. The only areas where they don't is if it's a large body of water or here, if you look into a, like a, a map, it's actually the slope is like this, so the elephants aren't going to cross there. So that, that makes sense. And the viaduct is around this area as well. So if you're an elephant over here, and the only way you can cross the road safely is the viaduct, are you going to walk 20 kilometers across? Probably, probably not. So they, they do cross the road wherever they want. So yeah, you may notice with these movement tracks, a lot of them are centered around the road. They're not moving up here or down here, this is all nice forest. So why are they spending so much time by the road? So that's something that I'm trying to answer with the, the movement data. And I think it's because of this. Like the plantations I mentioned before, there's lots of food. There's, there's much more disturbed habitat near the road. And with that disturbed <laughs> habitat, you get a lot more grasses. So the elephants don't have to move as far. And that's fine at the moment. In this northern part of Malaysia, there's very low human density, so there's not too much conflict with, with elephants and humans <coughs> at the moment in the north part. But I imagine in these kind of areas it will increase conflict if people start to move there because all the elephants are around the road and people like to live near roads and be centered to, to shops and, and facilities. So a master student looked at the <coughs> diet composition and we found that the elephants near the road had a lot more grasses in their dung and compared, and that was compared to elephants that we sampled deep into the forest. We found more woody parts and fiber as well. So that's a, a quite a nice little indication of, of why they're going to the uh, parts of, uh, sorry, beside the road. So that wraps up the, the infrastructure part of, of me. Amy, can I just ask one question? Yeah. So all the elephants you sampled like to be near the road. Is mm. it possible a case that you just ended up sampling those that like the road? And there's a whole different sample population that prefers the inner part, but you haven't seen them because they're always inside? So yeah, we, we have sampled deep into the forest as well. So You have? Yeah, so there was a, quite a long uh, translate. So we are able to sample deep into the forest and we have elephants that were GPS collared that, that have gone into the forest quite deep and we sampled them as well. Mm -hmm. So it is quite distinct that they if you're back. far away from the road, you don't eat much grasses because it's a closed mm -hmm. canopy. Mm -hmm. If you're close to the road, then it's a, it's a, it's a higher percentage. Yeah. Okay. 
May I ask if they're frugivorous? Aren't they frugivorous? Uh, eating fruit. They do eat lots they're, of fruit. They're free. sampling different. Sorry? They're sampling different spatial and temporal areas where trees come into fruit. Yeah. I noticed you had grasses, and I saw something called monarch. I wasn't yeah, sure. so monocots. Monocots. Yeah. <coughs> but leaves, not fruit. D elephants eat a lot of fruit, right. definitely. They, they are the... That's what I thought. That's why I only saw these yeah. in your sample. So they eat a lot of fruit, and they are probably the only internal disperser of seeds in the whole of the forest. So without elephants, you wouldn't have such a wide distribution of, of fruit in trees. They'd right. all be nice and clustered. Same, as, same for Asian as African. Yeah. So yeah, uh, without the elephants, then yeah, not as, not as wide distribution. But they're not strictly frugivorous. They eat grasses and they eat fruit. They eat anything, really. They're just yeah. like a garbage disposal. Opportunistic. Yeah. OK, yeah, thanks for those questions. So yeah, the effectiveness of HEC. So that means human-elephant conflict. And, we, and Meme is looking at the mitigation methods currently used in Malaysia and what else can be done. So translocation is the primary mitigation method in Malaysia. And what that means is if when an elephant is causing conflict, it's usually at a plantation or at eating someone's crops, they sedate the elephant <coughs> by tranquilizing it, then they pull it out of wherever they tranquilize it from and into a truck with the help of domestic elephants. Now, they have been doing this process since the 70s and have translocated over 600 elephants in Malaysia. So why Meme is interested in this is because there's a 30% mortality rate with these translocations, so that's quite high. Mm -hmm. The cost of one translocation is, is, is expensive, it's around 50,000 ringgit. And when they released these elephants, that was it, they didn't know what happened to them. Where did they go? Did they survive? So that's where Meme comes in, and we're putting GPS collars on these elephants that have been translocated. <coughs> and we're looking to see where they go and are they surviving. So this is one elephant, and it was captured here and it was tra uh, released here. So by the road, that's about 50 to 60 kilometers. And within eight days, it went back to where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> just like bears. Just like that. And, and it just resumed its normal daily routine. So translocation has a high mortality rate. It's very expensive. And it doesn't always work. We see so far with our data that elephants can move back up to 100 <coughs> kilometers away from where they were translocated. <coughs> so you have to move them very, very far away for them not to come back. Also, when you move them away, it doesn't solve the conflict either. The conflict still gets reported in there, there's still other elephants, so unless you translocate every elephant in that area away, and that's very hard to do because they're hard to find in a forest, you know? It's not like a savanna where you can see them, they're in a rainforest, it's, you know, you could walk up to an elephant and you wouldn't know it's there. It's quite, quite hard to see them sometimes. So, with those, yeah, with those problems with translocation, Malaysia didn't have this kind of information before. Now we can say, well, there may be other options that we need to pursue if, if, if you want to become more effective. So what Epin is doing, she is looking at the, the stress of, of elephants with translocation. So she's looking at the hormones in the dung. Hmm. And translocation is a, a very stressful thing. So I mentioned there's a, quite a high mortality rate and elephants can die during translocation and after translocation. So Ibn is quantifying how stressful is this for elephants and comparing that to captive elephants but also wild elephants that were not translocated as well. <coughs> so if not translocation, uh, what else can we do? Electric fences, that's, that's quite a common mitigation method and it can be quite effective sometimes. So our social scientist superstar, Vanita, she's gone around and she is surveying areas with electric fences to work out why are some working and why are some not, because it's very variable in how effective they are working. And we think that has to do with the perception of, of who has the ownership of the electric fence. And let me, let me 
<coughs> touch on that a little bit more. So everyone agrees the electric fence is effective. There's no question about that. <coughs> Do they suffer any conflict afterwards? Most people agree not. Do you need any other mitigation? People generally say that electric fences are very good, but are they willing to bear the costs? No. That was a big surprise for us. Why would they not want to pay for something to protect their own property? That was something that we didn't expect. And people in Malaysia, <coughs> the ownership of the elephant is apparently the government's responsibility. So the people believe that it's the government that should pay the cost. So the government goes around and gives out electric fences to certain people, but these fences aren't maintained. And when they are not maintained, the elephants break in, not well, break in, but they just walk in and they, and, and they cause conflict again. So we found that people who <coughs> bought their own electric fences, had ownership of it, they maintained it much better than people who didn't buy their electric fences. So that seems to be a very key point. And when they had bought their own electric fence and maintained it, they were very, very happy with their, with their conflict. It was pretty much non-existent. So that mm. is a key factor is if you give someone freebies, it, it's probably not going to solve the problem in this context. So human-elephant conflict, it's always location dependent. It's very hard to have a, a plan or a, a diagram where you can say, all right, if this happens, then follow this side of the chart. If it happens, this follows that side of the chart. So an integrated method, it needs to be flexible. It needs to be robust <coughs> and, and always needs to be locally dependent because there are different things going on within, within landscapes and within countries. So we think that we should have a, a Swiss Army knife approach. We should have multiple tools and we can get out those tools when we need different kind of solutions. And one of those tools we think is land use planning. Now, land use planning is all good, but coordinating land use planning is, is very <coughs> hard, and, but very important. So the, the Central Forest Farm Project, they're, they're saying that they want to link up certain areas and have linkages between forests. That's a good start for the direction of, of, of connecting forest patches for elephants. However, you need that to be interlinked with the people in the, the plantations. Where are they going to be expended? Because if you get a plantation there and it disconnects forest and you get all these kind of problems. So having coordinating land use plans, it, it, we think is a, a key strategy for the future. Electric fences, definitely. They are without doubt the best mitigation method out there. People have tried using chilies and beehives and a bunch of <coughs> other things and they are kind of effective but the electric fence is much more effective and a well maintained electric fence is pretty good but they <coughs> don't work 100% of the time don't let me try to sell you an electric fence but they, they work probably like 90% 95% so that's, that's a big increase but when they do break in there should be compensation schemes for the people that are doing the right thing, okay? So, not just giving money to anybody, but people that are doing the right thing, maintaining them well, and when elephants do get in. The Elephant Conservation Centre, it, it's quite surprising when we go there and we talk to people, how many people don't know there's elephants and tigers in Malaysia, and, 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 and they're local people. So, education will be very <coughs> important for the future, because knowing what the elephants are doing, what the elephants need in their, in their life and how they go about getting that can increase kind of empathy between people and, and an increase in tolerance. <coughs> translocation. It does sound like a bad thing, but there are cases where we need translocation. So if you've got a forest patch and it's shrinking and, and the elephants can't live there anymore, we need to move them out because otherwise they're going to starve. So that's when translocation is very useful and, and can <coughs> save the elephants. So lastly, just going to brush up on the social structure. So a master student is putting camera traps, so it pretty much detects when any animal moves, walks past it, and they're placing them in mineral licks. So that is an area where elephants <coughs> go to eat soil, 
to counteract the, the toxins in their stomach because the toxins in uh, the leaves can be quite harsh sometimes. So instead of putting cameras all through the forest, we are putting cameras at mineral licks because elephants visit them regularly every couple of weeks or a month. So we're limiting the elephants come to us. And this is a video of what some elephants do when they're coming to the mineral licks. So this is a family, all females and young siblings. And so we are also using the ears to identify individuals. So you can see here this ear is quite a unique hole in it. And wherever we put a camera in the forest, the elephants will always find them. They, they know where they are. So when, trunk, when their trunk is going up, that means that they know something's funny going on. So they're smelling the camera. So what, what we've found so far, uh, by me, she's found out that an average group in Malaysia, when they come to a mineral lick, is about six individuals. And it's usually got a couple of adult females, and the rest are either sub-adult ju juveniles or, or infants. We do get bulls coming in as well, but they're normally just by themselves. So that <coughs> wraps up the, the research side of things for me. So if you are interested in, in keeping in touch with us, we do have a, a, a Facebook page that you can, you can go and visit, you can like. We have a bunch of videos as well online. And we have a, a newsletter as well that comes out irregularly, maybe a month, maybe six months. But we do come out when we, when we have time to, to publish something as well. So yeah. So just to, to quickly sum up, so what is MEME? We're a, we're a research project with the government and a university, and we're trying to collect data so the government can make decisions based on data instead of, instead of expert knowledge. So we're trying to use cost-effective tools to, to collect this data. One thing that Angie has shown so far is that without doubt, the range is shrinking very fast for elephants. With mitigation strategies, so resolving conflict, the current use of translocation as the primary mitigation method doesn't work all the time and it's currently not working a lot of the time. So having a more holistic approach or the Swiss <coughs> Army knife approach of, of using different electric fences and proper land use management is a much better way to, to ensure that. So yes, the last thing to wrap up is the importance of elephants in ecosystems. So Without elephants, we wouldn't have any free trees and we wouldn't have so many different types of trees in the forest. So without them, the, the, the forest would look much barer or much more, wouldn't be as many species, basically. So yeah. With that, we just want to say thanks to our financial support. Singapore Zoo does a lot of stuff with me. They give us money for our, for our collars and funding for different projects. So, if anyone here is from Singapore Zoo, thank you very, very much. You are special one. Yeah. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you.